<laughs> all right. So to begin with, I would like all our uh, esteemed panelists to first, you know, talk a little bit about themselves because we were just discussing this morning that it is so important that people see the personality of a chef, uh, you know, which goes beyond the food that he creates because I think that kind of culminates and tells us a story of why he creates the kind of food he creates. So I think it's, it's nice to know a little more about them than just their food. So I'm going to start the session with a little chat about all of them and I would allow them to speak. We'll start with our very own executive chef from here and he's promised the, the what is it, the Sheer Mal Ran. No, the Parda, Parda Ran tonight. So I'm hoping I get that. But uh, let me start with you. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Vivek Bhatt, uh, and I've been at it cooking for 20 years now. And I must say, what a fabulous uh, choice of profession. I mean, not only that I love cooking, but I think the, the most beautiful part of cooking food for people you like or just cooking is that it's instant gratification. It's a noble cause, of course. Uh, and, but more than that, it is about the passion which you manifest in the creations that you have. And that's what really, really keeps me excited about cooking every day. Every day it brings something new, uh, uphill tasks, challenges, adds value to me as a person professional. It allows you to travel uh, and make you go places, literally. And in a nutshell, that's what I like to do. Um, namaskar everybody, good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm chef from London. Uh, I have a restaurant in, in Bristol and opening another one soon um, in the UK only. And I'm very honored to be here because I think it's very, very important to bring all the industry people together uh, and talk about the new trends and what's happening in the world and help each other really. Um, I have a lot of help from, from, from lots of chefs in the UK. And, and, and we, if we can help each other with different ways, it's really, really important. And the trends are always changing, as me and Alex were talking. The trends are uh, regional food is very becoming huge in the UK. Um, and the street food. Uh, Everybody is taking the concept from street food, and it's becoming so big. And that's what I do in my restaurant quite a lot. Uh, so it's, um, and as I said, you know, part to be panel with all and talk about it, it's, it's quite good to be here. Thank you. We'll chat more with you. Alex, over to you. Yeah, I think um, from my side, that I means very similar. It goes back to what you have said. I think regional products become very famous, especially in India. In our module in Anamaya, we have spent a lot of time in sourcing the ingredients, really go down to the farmers, to the producers. And I came across a lot of very, very interesting stories, which, you know, makes the product all of a sudden much more emotional because the farmers spend so much time and so much effort in producing something which we just put on the table or put in a deep fryer and say thank you very much. Um, so yeah, our module on, for me it's all about the ingredients because only I believe with good ingredients you can cook good food. And uh, yeah, I think that's our philosophy when it comes to food and products. Well, um, hi, uh, my name is Gautam Chaudhary and I, uh, I represent a brand which is called Demiurgic Hospitality. Uh, under uh, Demiurgic Hospitality, we, uh, we do takeaway and delivery spaces, delivery restaurants. Um, in the past, I have been associated with um, brands like uh, Obroy, Hyatt, uh, have been associated with the Great Kebab Factory very, very closely. Um, I've done a lot of work in uh, food and beverage, has been here for the last 20 years. Looking forward to this session and uh, talking about food trends. Great. So great to have you all here. And, uh, you know, I'll start by talking about Chef Alex. Uh, the last time I came to Delhi, I stayed at uh, Andaz. And I walked in and this pretty good looking guy just walks up to me and says, uh, you know, should we have breakfast together? And I'm looking at him and I'm like, yeah, I was hungry. So let's have breakfast. So I thought there was this guy who was just, you know, trying to impress me and stuff like that. So I just went with the flow only to realize he was the executive chef of the uh, hotel. But what was very interesting is when he started telling me about the food hall that they have created there with all the local ingredients, uh, you know, it, it was nice to see a foreigner feel so passionately about our Indian, you know, ingredients and foods and wants to celebrate it. 
which brings me to our first topic of discussion, which is uh, something which I want to, uh, you know, chat about is uh, superfoods. Uh, we discussed a few of them then, and uh, today I think it's important that, you know, we touch superfoods from the point of view of Indian superfoods. You know, superfoods is, a, I think, a, 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 a name given and celebrated more abroad, but it's nice to see the attention going back to our, you know, simple Indian ingredients, which are actually super food, so to speak. And I want to ask all our chefs here one by one. Um, chef, I'll start with you. That what do you think for you, what is a super food that you want to celebrate? And do you see that these are going to be forming a trend setting, uh, you know, part in, in our menus, uh, you know, in the coming years? Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, take for example, Ulsi, now called flaxseed. Until a few years ago, nobody perhaps in their right minds would have it unless they were forced to. But today it's one of the hottest superfoods being sold in all supermarkets, hotels, restaurants, because it has those values which will... The focus has been on well-being for quite some time now, but celebrating it with food is something... So this is something which celebrates celebrating wellness with food. Flexseed is... It, and it's here to stay. Uh, like I said, it's available commercially. It's being used in, as ingredients in restaurants, breakfast, salad bars. And uh, this is what, this is what it is. Yeah. Um, for me, I think in the, in the UK and abroad, I, I'm not sure about India at the moment. Turmeric has become huge. Haldi is like haldi latte, this latte, that latte. I mean, we have been using turmeric for generations for anything from wedding to any festivals, any, anything, and food. And um, a publisher came to me and said, Romy, can you write a book on turmeric? I said, every food in India, we, in households, put turmeric in it. You know, it's not... Um, when I was growing up, my, um, the lady who used to work in our house, her, her son broke his arm, and she was applying... On, on the hand that it um, heals quickly. And my mom, while growing up, she wouldn't let me use any um, face packs or anything. She would make the with haldi and yogurt and dal and make a, f I think it's really good. My face is still, I'm 45 now and, and, and I think I still glow. Um, the turmeric is, is, has become so, so huge. And, as a, and spices, I think it's, there are so many healing process in them that if you take all the spices, they have so many, um, you know, values of, of, of things and to understand, I think for me to write about turmeric, I'm quite excited about it. I think that is for me is a superfood. Okay. Chef Alex? Yeah, you see, I think for me, everything started really with the journey of exp trying to understand what are the ingredients available in India because I have only traveled to India six years ago. I went to Goa and that's uh, already it, what I saw about India. Uh, and then when I came, I wanted to see, we wanted to write the menu and I wanted to know what, what is there. And, you know, we came across the millets, all the different rice, all the grains, you know, all the stuff which we in Europe not really use because we just, you know, think uh, sometimes whatever we have around the corner is what we want to work with. And then, um, you know, you start working with this and all of a sudden you start to understand the ingredients because you want to know about it. If you look at millets, you know, we fly quinoa all across the world from Peru, but when you have amrant in India, which is one of your oldest ingredients. So I said, why do we have to fly the one from Peru? So I think that's where the whole thought process comes and the superfood comes exactly uh, with it because that's all the old ingredients which have been, well, the world is, in, is a system, right? So eventually, many, 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 many hundreds of thousands of years back, something has started to grow for a reason in a typical area because of a typical climate. So the people in this area who were the workers, who were the hunters, whatever, were living from these ingredients, which has all the proteins and all the, you know, yeah, proteins which you need in that area. And I think these days now we need to go back and try to understand why is actually the black peas only growing in Ladakh and not somewhere else. So I think that's where the whole thought comes from. And that I think it's in relation to the superfood uh, because that's all the ingredients we haven't really looked at. And uh, once you start looking at it, you will understand why it's called superfood. Because it has all the proteins and all the nutrition and whatever you would like to have. Right. Chef. I think uh, I agree with uh, all of them. What Chef Moser is talking about is uh, the bi biodynamic uh, uh, growth patterns and consumption patterns. 
which is uh, uh, a growing, uh, which is growing at a very, very fast pace, and uh, people are accepting it uh, with open arms. Um, when we talk about spooper foods, primarily what comes to our mind is uh, broccoli, quinoa, olive oil. Um, I think uh, Chef Romi very well put up turmeric. Uh, people are talking about turmeric latte these days. We have grown up. You know, our grannies have been feeding us with uh, haldi ka dood, and it is it is a superfood. You talk about um, uh, rajgiri, which is amaranth, uh, very very you know very high uh, antioxidants, very rich uh, in terms of uh, proteins, uh, amino acids, uh, very rich on all three vitamins: vitamin A, B, C, uh, desi ghee, amla. They are all superfoods, and they are packed. They are power packed with uh, various nutrients. I think India is a land where uh, we get everything and uh, we do not utilize it in our uh, day to day uh, eating habits. I think we, sh we need to be educated in that pattern and uh, yeah. We have to go back to roots and, which, and go to prove that you know our grandmothers were actually right in feeding us what they did. Um, so if we talk about trends of 2017, you know, trends in 2017, what do you see emerging? You know, we all are now understanding that health has become a, a big thing. And, uh, you know, as a chef, what also happens is we obviously tend to concentrate on taste. But how do we create a balance between taste and nutrition? Because now, even though I'm a chef, I have to be a responsible chef. I have to take into uh, the picture of uh, global warming. I have to take into picture that a lot of people are intolerant to a lot of ingredients that are probably hybrid and therefore not, you know, uh, you know, being, uh, uh, we, being digested well by our system. So somebody is, you know, gluten intolerant, somebody is lactose intolerant. And of course, like I said, global warming is a huge factor. So how do we as chefs become responsible chefs and how do we balance this too? How do we make sure that we are giving tasty food to people but somewhere not compromising as much on health? And how do you see this trend evolving? How do you think as a chef you could, you know, what do you think you could do to make healthy food trendy and tasty? Chef? I think the first step towards uh, healthy, sustainable, uh, and interesting cuisine is uh, correct sourcing, sustainable sourcing. Now, the population is only growing and our demands are only increasing. We have to make sure that as, as responsible businessmen, as responsible hotel, restaurant industry, we are not only curtailing the responsible buying, but also encouraging that we're giving back to the community in some form or the other. Now, not only it makes a great story in terms of of, of human interest, but it also shows the rest of the world that yes, we've got to be sensible. Now we can't be so gluttonous that in our, our desire, in our need, in our wish to have the most interesting food and the most tasty food, we are demolishing what has taken millions of years to what it is today. And I think that's one step towards uh, nutritional, responsible uh, restaurant business and eating. Romy, what, what changes do you think you can bring? You're, you're in London and you run this amazing kitchen, Romy's Kitchen. What do you think you can do? I mean, I've seen, some, I've seen your menu and it's all yummy food. In fact, I can't wait to come and try it next time. But how do you think, you know, you could introduce a few nutritious things which are as tasty and, you know, make it a trendsetter? See, um, in my restaurant, everything is, I mean, um, I, I live in Southwest and everything comes from Southwest. It does not cross Southwest. And I, for me, my forte is game. See, game is very seasonal. You can get, have game like venison or wild boar or quail all throughout the year. The game season is from August to October, November, kind of depending on the weather. And I work with the, the spices take on really, really well. So in a UK, the trend has become spices, lot of chefs who are Michelin star staff forming, you know, all that kind of stuff is trending out a bit. And they're using a lot of spicing in their cooking to balance because spices, I'm learning more and more when I'm writing this book, I'm learning more and more that each and every spice has a health benefit. Um, at the same time, I use a lot of rapeseed. 
which is very similar to mustard oil. But it, the temperature goes high, higher um, than oil. I don't really use olive oil in my cooking is because it's good for you, but also we don't label, you know, you can get really good olive oil. You have to, be, you have to know the olive oil really well because olive oil can be, sometimes they the virgin olive oil, it can't be virgin oil because the producers are not producing it right. So that's why the rapeseed oil I use is very, very, it has a lot of health benefits again, but I also use ghee. If people want to use ghee, I use ghee and give on the side. But for me at the moment, what I really think is, what is that Baba called, Baba Ramdev or something? Look at him, he's making so much money with going back to roots and look at his products. He's, he's very clever. We should all, chefs as chefs, do something like that, you know? And um, I, I always hear from people, he's doing this, he's doing that. I'm like, oh my God, what about that churan with pomegranate? You know, all these uh, my grandmas used to dry the pomegranate seeds and used to make pomegranate molasses years and years ago. And uh, Ottolonghi has made it huge. You know, if you know Ottolonghi, um, he's a very, very talented chef and he does with pomegranate molasses the Persian style of cooking. But he also use a lot of spices and vegetables. He doesn't eat a lot of meat, but he also, we should use, utilize a lot of our vegetables that we have in a, grow if you can. A lot of people don't really grow that, you know. Um, and Alex would agree with me because in U Europe, we, we kind of use a lot of our seasonal produce, which we kind of don't use in our country here. Yeah, I think, um, especially talking about seasonal, I think one very sad factor, in my opinion, is that these days people don't even know what vegetable, what fruit is in season right now. Now, if you look at the mangoes, everybody knows there's no mango season because you don't find the Alfonso mango anymore. But when you come to cauliflower, when you come to watermelon, right, in summertime people eat cauliflower, which theoretically you shouldn't eat because it's heating up your body. So there's a lot of these factors which I think the consumer is not just enough aware of in order to change their food habits to be more healthy. Um, and again, in the supermarket, you find, you find uh, I mean, all the vegetables, all the fruits all year long. I mean, we focus especially on seasonal uh, vegetable. We work with a small farm outside of, um, of Delhi in Tijara, a small biodynamic farm where we buy the vegetable from. And, you know, we had beautiful carrots. And I placed the order recently. She said, there's no more carrots. I said, why there's no carrots? She said, well, carrots are not in season right now. So I said, what is in season? She said, uh, beetroot. I said, then let's work with beetroot. So I think we chefs also need to change our mindset in terms of writing the menus and creating dishes and not just say, okay, I want to have my sebas and the supplier runs around the world and finds your sebas to have it on the menu. When I said you have a coastline of India, which is probably, I think, the biggest coastline of a country can have, uh, you have seafood all over the place, but not just everything all the time. So you really need to speak to the fishermen to understand now, what seafood can I get? Prawn farms, right? You have uh, 26 prawn farms in India, and you can get this stuff all year long. So it's very interesting to, I mean, very important to understand what's available, what is there. Ask your farmer, what is he producing? Don't tell the farmer, make, create for me watermelons, because it's dependent on the ground. Does the watermelon grow in the ground? There's so many factors, which I think we as chefs, and, and you know, even myself, three years back, has never really thought of, and I think it's so important because it makes such a difference. And again, the reflection goes back to your health, right? It's, and it's interesting you advantage. say, ask your farmer, because most of us don't even know our farmers. I, 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 used to, I, yeah. I used to have the saying, right? Yeah, I said, everybody knows his banker, everybody yeah. knows his lawyer, but nobody knows his farmer. How many of us here know our farmers? Does anybody know where you're getting your ingredients from, your produce from, your vegetables from? Does anybody know? It's okay, you're not the only one, don't worry. We, none of us do because that is the fact it's okay we don't know but now the whole thing is that what should become trendy is to know about your farmer you know like we have celebrated now chefs earlier chefs were not known as much as they are known today and i think it's it's a great it's great that we know our chefs today but in the same way i think we need to celebrate our farmers because you know life is all about food and we we spend more than half our lives eating so it's really important that we forget anything else. We should give that due respect to at least the person who's growing all that food. So we must make that effort to get to know them. Chef, your, your views on this. You know, uh, yesterday when uh, Miss Maria uh, opened the session, she mentioned a point which was uh, art of simplicity. 
you know, that, that carries a lot of meaning which all of us are trying to say right now that uh, we need to go back to our roots. We need Sorry, to the art of what? Congrats. Art of simplicity. Simplicity. Okay, so, yeah. so we need to go back to our roots. We need to, we need to uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of work in last seven, eight years and I have been a part and parcel of uh, it. Uh, there's a lot of work which has happened around in the culinary world on progressive cuisines. So in terms of progressive cuisine, we are, uh, we are uh, trying to source out anything and everything from the world. It's a global world. And we are uh, getting the best of the worlds uh, uh, in any and every arena and trying to uh, adapt those particular ingredients into our recipes. So there's a lot of work which is happening around it. But in, in the process, I believe that we are forgetting or slipping the, the dynamics of uh, uh, what is grown in what season and uh, that seasonal produce should be used and emphasized. We are eating uh, watermelons around the year, absolutely very well said. I think uh, we chefs need to take a step forward. There's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, detailing that, that stays on our shoulder and we need to educate uh, the consumer. It is very important. That's a, a good point, again, like which I've been reiterating that, you know, now I think the fact that, our, you know, we chefs are being celebrated so much, I think now it kind of gives us that added responsibility to kind of, you know, spread the right message, educate people about, you know, things that we have the knowledge uh, about. All right, so, um, okay, this has been an interesting health discussion so far. Let's kind of change the track a little and get, uh, you know, get uh, a little to something called concept cuisine. Now, this is something which is, again, a new trend. You know, we've, you know, we've been seeing different, different concepts. We've had fusion food. We've had, you know, different kind of um, concepts, so to speak, which go beyond just food. Again, they, they tell a story. Like, for example, the kind of food I do, my concept is my determination tells and talks about my determination to feed my children and the whole family in, uh, uh, on the whole healthy food. So that's my story. That's, that's what determines the kind of food I create. What's your story, Chef? And what concept are you working on? What is, what is something, are you, you, are you trying to create a new concept? What, what should Chef uh, Vivek Bhatt be known as or known for by the end of this year? So what we believe in and what we are rather successfully worked on is, is immersive experience. Now, I won't, I won't pin that concept into uh, a, a, a cuisine per se or, or a style of cooking. What it is is immersive. Now, we not only eat with our, our, our hands and mouth, but we also eat with our eyes. And food, eating food in itself is a holistic experience. And what we believe in and what we strongly and like I said, successfully worked on is, is a completely immersive experience wherein, like I said in the, uh, j just, just now, um, responsible sourcing, uh, honoring what is available in season because that's the best thing to you, for you to process and, and use for, for meals at that point in time. Uh, interaction, openness in terms of whatever is being made, how it is being made in a very transparent manner. So at one time, I think the work of chefs like a secret agent, nobody knew what they were doing. Yes, they were doing something, cooking food, but no one knew what exactly was happening. It's turn around and it is something which is very interactive. So whatever the guest wants to know, guest wants to feel, a guest wants to understand, wants to order, if responsible, if can be arranged, if uh, should be a part of that experience. And if that, that means that you want to walk into my kitchen and try the dish out with my chefs or with myself, you're more than happy to do so. So the whole concept changed from not just not eating but an immersive experience wherein it's a holistic experience, which not only satisfies your mind, your body, but also your soul. And that's what we have very successfully done. Chef Roman. Uh, for me, in my restaurant, we change our menu very quickly, every four to five weeks. Um, I, I only depend on seasons, and I, my cuisine is very much modern Indian food. It's taking the ingredients like gurnard, like any fish, haik or anything, or monkfish, and then uh, use the spicing or herbs, and then, you know, give a little twist to it. And I use, I have a lot of influence of Spanish food. So my food is very much kind of tapas food. Um, you can share, and, and Indian food is all about sharing anyway. It's a thali you share with others. This, this concept is same. But I, I think my restaurant survives and people like the food because I don't have, and Alex and myself were talking about butter chicken and dal makhani. People love that. Um, I make a lot of money with that. I do have that on my, on my menu. 
Uh, and uh, it's the simple food, but butter chicken made right with a little cake can really change the dish, you know, and the taste look of the dish. Uh, people are used to that, but at the same time, I don't have any ball tea in my restaurant because if you know, if you ever been travel to UK, you will know they have dishes like balti. Balti means bucket. Balti is to bucket, na? And I make fun of that because I just think that they've created all these dishes which doesn't mean anything, you know? Um, so for me, um, having, uh, I, I, I always stick to my roots because I am born and brought up here. I grew up eating, when I went to UK and I first time went um, to a restaurant, my husband took me out and it was a Bangladeshi restaurant and, and I was super excited because I missed my family, I missed my friends. You, you're young and you're naive and you want, you, you're missing home basically. And he took me to a restaurant and I, my fingers were pink because they were using a lot of coloring in it. And I just told my husband and he looked at me, I said, I will open a restaurant. And after 20 years, I did open a restaurant. I, was, I stick to the word. And I, I love playing with different kind of flavors and I learn from people. You know, I learn all the time. When I come to India, for me, I go to street food. I know it's, I just learn the way they make things. And I, for me, it's very, very important. And I go back in my restaurant and change to that twist or anything, you know, if Alex said or some other chefs is talking about things, I will go back and try to change it and may maybe I can put this and it'll look really great. And for me, plating is very important. And every dish in my restaurant, we wine match it really well. Because Indian food, red wine is really hard to wine match it. So we have wine matched every, each and every dish or the cider or beer, local beers. We, we have some amazing local beers. Um, and Kingfisher is obviously there, people relate Kingfisher to it. But I think food goes, but people also go out to drink. So it's very, very important that you wine match your, or any drink match your food. I think I, um, I, I, I think that's, this is very, for me, if I go to a restaurant, that's very, very important. Thank you, that's really nice. That's really interesting, everything that you said. And it's nice that somebody is like Chef Alex, coming from abroad, he's celebrating our Indian food here. Our uh, chef, our very own uh, chef here, is living abroad and celebrating our food there and, you know, taking people's minds beyond the butter chicken, like we said, which is great. Uh, thank you for doing that. Chef. Oh, sorry. I miss you in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> chef sure. Alex, back to you. Actually, My why don't we change the order? Maybe, you know, yeah, let's, why, why, you, yeah, yeah. since I asked you first, let's, let's go with you. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> So I feel, uh, um, you know, the, the, the work that I have been doing, uh, I have been associated with uh, brands like uh, Tanzor, which is a restaurant that I launched in Beverly Hills. Uh, this restaurant was about progressive Indian cuisine. That's one of my traits and what uh, my cuisine is known for. Uh, I have done a, a, a similar work in a Connaught Place based restaurant, which is called 38 Barracks. Uh, Progressive Indian cuisine, I, what I primarily try to do there is uh, uh, without confusing in terms of cooking techniques, I stick to classical Indian. I believe that Indian cuisine has a lot and lots to offer and Indian ingredients have a lot to offer uh, to the palate. Uh, so uh, I utilize the same cooking techniques and as uh, Chef Romy mentioned, I uh, work around on the plate and uh, create, an, uh, create a nice looking plate because the first interaction for a customer with the food is through his eyes. Uh, it is important that the plate needs to look good. Um, this is one of the concepts that I work with and uh, this, is, this is what my cuisine is. Great. Yeah, I think the uh, Chef Vivek, uh, touch the point. I think these days the trends is all about the experience. It's all about the story. What story do you have to tell? Um, when you, when you, I mean, again, I can only take our uh, food hall as an example. Uh, there's every product which is on the retail on the shelf has a story to tell. Either it's a story about the farmer, either it's a story about the product, either it's about the social contribution to society. Um, so people are all of a sudden are catched already. Now, when I, when, I, when I came and I told my boss that I'm going to put a chicken with some roast potato on the menu, he said, it's too boring. I said, wait, hold on a second. Let me tell you a story. Yeah. So I told a story about the chicken, where the chicken came from, how it was grown up. And, you know, all of a sudden, that chicken was not just this boring chicken, which I had in the beginning. It was a chicken which had really a story to it. So people had a relation. People had an experience. Uh, people, had, people had memories from their childhood. I think all of these factors are very important these days when we when we open concepts 
uh, because people need to feel related to it. Uh, when you talk about good food, good food we can argue about because somebody might like the palate of the taste, somebody might not like. The only thing we cannot argue about is about the quality. Now, if somebody comes to me, I didn't like your food, it's a bad quality, say, what exactly you didn't like? He said, I didn't like the taste. So there was nothing wrong with the quality. He said, no, quality actually was good, but the taste. So, so you see, I think it's very important to bring these informations to the customer because then you have a relation to it. Then you know, oh, there is a concept and actually somebody thought about it. Besides this, when we opened Anamaya, we said we wanted to give the whole thing a purpose because if you, we looked at the 15 most successful companies in the world and they said the first five, they all have a purpose of existence. So we wanted to give a purpose of existence to Anamaya, to the food hall and said we want to conquer the social conscious mind by experimental food and education because we do a lot of education when it comes. We grow our own microgreens. We have a big farm. Uh, where, we, where we grow in the restaurants, we make people aware what is microgreens actually for. It's not just the little decoration part as we use for chef because it has a very high nutrition, 4 to 40 more times of nutri uh, than a normal lettuce. So I think all of this comes into the experience and I think that's why people are coming back because every time you come there's something new to learn. Nice. So the concept is basically also, you know, telling a story like uh, we cool. said. It, it's, it's wrapped around a story. And it's nice for people also to appreciate that story because then they appreciate that food a lot more. So uh, this morning when I was here, somebody asked me, are we going to talk about baking today? I think he's a new baker. Who's that gentleman? Are you still here? Or Yeah, there he is. Okay, so we, uh, that was one of the topics that we were uh, you know, going to touch. Wake and bake, it's called. And uh, are we really opening up to you know, baking as a new, you know, are we trying to sense, uh, set some new trends in baking, I mean, a broad uh, dessert for breakfast has become uh, the new thing. What about India? What do, you, what do you see? How do you see baking pan out? You know, how important it is here and what is happening with baking? Are, are there any new trends in baking, so to speak? I think baking has taken over the world like a storm. I mean, my wife every day asks me, a new recipe, you know, you've got to give me, get me the recipe for that. So that, that's just what's happening at home. But I think uh, awareness has changed over the last couple of years. People are more aware of, of new cooking styles, cuisines, world cuisine concepts, and, and everyone has acquired some knowledge about food. Now, I think baking is something which has always fascinated people in general. It had been an out-of-bounds area for, for regular housewives in India, but today all that has changed. And that change which has happened at home perhaps is reflecting on in the restaurant scene. Independent bakeries are coming up which are making fantastic desserts. Ingredients are easily available which allows them to make very, very classy bakeries and pastries. And that is what has inspired this revolution, if I may call it. And it is only going to get better with more exposure, with more ingredients available. The world is getting smaller in terms of global availability. Now, there are seasonal availabilities, yes, but there are also times when if I want to use something to make a particular dish, it is now available. It can be available at the store at the corner or, 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 or a specific store which only sells gourmet products. So that revolution, yes, has changed the way uh, India or, or restaurants have been cooking. And I think it's only going to get stronger as, as, as the time passes. Chef Romy, you have some interesting baking uh, things happening in your restaurant there? I do. I mean, I want to touch a base on, I mean, years ago, like, my mom used to cook a really simple meal and, you know, bake really simple. I'm born and brought up in, in West Bengal where um, my dad worked in a steel plant and people came to work from all over India. And there is a lot of Christians in Asansol where um, Chef Savvy and Vivek Singh is from there. Um, and baking was quite a huge part and my mom learned it. Mom used to do make simple parathas, and we, because we are come from a very Punjabi family, um, what my mom started watching was Sanjeev Kapoor. Sanjeev Kapoor changed women who were cooking at home. He gave hope to women they can do different things as well. And I think nowadays, what Sanjeev Kapoor do, did years ago, now television with Great British Bake Off or Nigella or people, you know, you are on television and lot, lot of women or men on television are showing us how to do what. And, women, and people at home, as Chef Vivek said, have become very knowledgeable about either from one way or the other. They've started to, 
I mean, everybody has become a nowadays food blogger, you know? People want to write about things, which is great um, in a way because either, um, one thing I really hate, dislike is TripAdvisor. I do not like it. You know, people just have so much time to write, write about the food, you know, like talk about the food you've come to eat and not moan about various things. Um, but baking, I, I will put my hands up. I'm not great at it. I, I don't want to even go for it. My daughters who are 14 and 12 are amazing bakers. So my daughter bakes cakes for my restaurant. I pay her. Um, so uh, kids are becoming more and more knowledgeable about it. And um, my staff, they will say, chef, can we make this way or that way? I let them do it. I think baking is something also very comforting. You know, you've in a relationship or something's happened or something. I think it is very, com for me, it's very comforting. I love it. I can live without lots of things. For me, cakes are so important. You know, bread is so important. I feel that gives me something when I miss my parents or friends uh, back in India that gave me comfort at the time where I needed it. So I think um, it's good that women are, and men, I mean, especially I think in UK, like m my husband is a great cook. He cooks for me in the weekend. I do not cook. After cooking for seven days, you know, five or six days a week, I love my cheese and so toast. That's comforting for me, you know. Um, and, and daughters bake for me all the time, so which is a really good thing, I think. It's interesting you spoke about your daughters because I also feel that baking and your baked food is more a trend for youngsters. You know, it's also a cool thing to walk into a coffee shop and in under three minutes you can pick up a muffin and coffee and, you know, you're done with your breakfast, so to speak. Uh, so I think it's also got that little cool fact, uh, you know, factor to it. And um, Chef Alex would probably agree with that. Yes. I mean, all his staff in the, in the hotel are dressed like this. So you don't even know if they're a part of the hotel or they're just friends, uh, you know, hanging around there. So. Yeah. No, I think baking is a very important part. And as you say that we are uh, actually opening in Moscow a restaurant which is all about baking. So there's hot dishes, savory dishes, uh, sweet dishes. So there's only three ovens in the restaurant and that's all about it. So I think that it's a very uh, yeah, interesting, interesting trend to see where it goes. Um, I think the sweet side eventually will die out a little bit because everybody again is on this nutrition and health and you know, so sweet is going to be something. It's going to be more savory, I guess. And then for me, obviously as a German, I like to experiment with bread. And especially with the different flowers you have in India, I think we have some really uh, yeah, fancy one with soya bean flour and uh, you know banana flour we tried recently. So I think that's where the fun factor comes into the game. You know, a new trend, I mean, just talking about it, uh, since we were talking about it, I thought of it, you know, we always learn uh, cooking in studios. It would be an interesting trend if restaurants or, you know, if hotels who have bakeries could have a little cookery session going on there, like you were talking about artisan breads. It'd be so fantastic if you, we have you know, that in UK you have that in UK. See, here you go. It's, it's, I think it's a nice thing when you go to a restaurant or a bakery, you see something happening, you enroll, you learn a little more about it. Because especially with breads, I mean, I'm a chef, but it, it kind of boil, bogs me down also. In fact, Every time I meet a chef, I sit him down, okay, now get this bread right for me. It's just not happening because obviously I try and make it healthier and healthy breads are no, not tasty. And that goes well, against even, my even family. Even if you goal. look at baking breads, I mean, baking bread is a profession himself, right? It's not just you're a chef, you should know how to make yeah. bread. I mean, I'm sorry, that's much more behind the door. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I have obviously the baker who experiments with me, yeah. but uh, I think that's very important to understand also. Yeah. That's why, it, that would, that's why it would be nice if hotels, big hotels, who have good bakers, you know, could actually do such sessions. It could be a new trend of 2017. Let's look at it. Let's Chef look at it. Gautam, back to you. Well, uh, uh, before I get into the bakery segment, I will unfold a few numbers. I was reading an article the other day, and surprisingly, uh, Indian baking industry is the third largest in the world. Uh, Indian baking industry is worth 10,000 CR. It's a lot, it's a huge. In this 10,000 CR, 80% of it is comprising of breads and cookies. You know, this market is huge and uh, it is uh, indeed picking up pace at a very, very high, high, high scale. Um, baking, as far as uh, with me is concerned, uh, you know, we, Indians have been, through my younger days, I remember that anyone's birthday would come up in the family, we will bake a cake at home. <laughs> you know, we never used to have uh, a, a, a tradition of going to the market and buying a cake. Uh, 
you know even today uh, it's my kids birthday or any birthday any 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 celebration at home we will baking uh, uh, has not been an integral part of indian culinary heritage but uh, uh, we have been very fond of uh, baking and uh, uh, we there's a lot of work which has which has been done uh, in bakery segment uh, lately yeah yeah it's interesting you said that because even my mother used to make the best cakes for me all my birthdays everybody you know the whole mohalla so to speak would wait for it would it would be a doll cake or a house cake and me being a chef i mean i've just started making you know baking cakes for the last 3 years because i said okay now at least my family member my best friends i should bake a cake for them you know we've just become attuned to going to the also because of the you know easy availability and the gourmet cakes that are being created i do understand that it's tough to create them at home but at least we can try you know because baking is something like you said is nice comfort food and if you can create it at home nothing like that you know i was actually thinking that probably germany will be much higher in terms of breads uh, making but uh, coincidentally the number one and number two positions are taken by us and china i guess that's based on the population right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, we are going to move on to some questions from the audience but i just want to quickly take this one uh, last topic uh, what just quickly touch upon it how do restaurants and chefs manage the cost factor of restaurants i mean i'm i think i'm lucky i don't have a restaurant and every time i propose having a restaurant my husband just tells me to shut up uh, he said you cook on tv and cook uh, you know on youtube but the people who are running it how do you manage to control costs how do you manage to ensure the best service at a good cost and yet provide as best products as best quality as you know you do see um, restaurants and hotels are two entirely different business models and they work on different uh, profit percentages now managing costs is very important for a business to sustain to grow and it's yes of course about feeding people and giving them a good time but it's also about making money uh, so that's a <laughs> it is a it is a tricky question so but just give us a rough idea I, okay, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I was in China before. Before I was here in Delhi, and we had a Japanese restaurant, outstanding Japanese restaurant, Japanese chef. The product was superior. We were, I was in close to Shanghai, and Tokyo was an hour and a half away. So the fresh seafood being flown in every day, outstanding product. Right next to our hotel was a Japanese street full of Japanese restaurant, massive Japanese population in that town, and uh, it was a street full of at least 30 or 40 Japanese restaurants. each one of that restaurant was packed every single day of the week hotel was not so we were wondering what are we doing wrong we have the right chef we have the right ingredients we have the right positioning we have everything that we need to have a successful restaurant is there but why is our restaurant not full and whereas the standing free standing restaurants are packed every single day of the week it does not matter if it's a weekend or a weekday so we've spoke to one of the restaurant manager who also happened to be a friend of one of my colleagues and he said we work at a 10% profit margin in that restaurant at the same time that hotel was working at 40% profit margin so in getting being sourced from the same market the source market was the same but the profit percentage was so different that the selling price there was huge discrepancy between what we were selling at as a hotel and what the restaurant was selling at and that was a business model for all the restaurant on that street so they were doing larger number of volume at a lesser percentage profit but overall profitability was much higher than the hotel at that point in time so in that particular market we had to change our business model to be competitive so sometimes as i said i mean business model differs from place to place city to city now as a hotelier if i have to say as as a as a hotel chef positioning is very important of how we position our restaurants because positioning and reputation will help you drive the revenues now but that can't be said for every business in this particular feel because position location of a restaurant how you position it will, will actually determine how you managing costs so this would vary from restaurant to restaurant business model to business model city to city that that's my take because there is no there is no blanket answer to this question really i totally agree with chef vivek because uh, you've answered it yeah. absolutely um 
But nowadays for small restaurants, I think PR is very important. Social media is very important. Um, if you're on Twitter or Instagram or, or on TV or writing books or whatever, it's, that's a very important factor. Um, I think social media has completely changed for various things. But rest, I think you've answered it all, all there. I think a lot is uh, about value for money, right? If somebody wants to eat a lobster, he has to pay a lobster. And I think that the pricing structure on the menu has to make sense to a customer. Uh, and uh, I have experienced places where it doesn't make any sense because I know exactly how much does my pasta cost, how much does the tomato cost, I know how much does the onion cost and how much the garlic, and the price was doubled and opposite, right, up on the street. So that doesn't make sense. So I think it has to be fair. And if you use organic vegetable, obviously it's a bit more expensive, so people have to understand. And, uh, you know, then the people make the choice. And yes, uh, as Chef Vivek said, we as hotels, I think, are now trying to catch up again with the standalones because obviously a lot of business goes through the standalones where we as a hotel have difficulties to fill our restaurants. We run restaurants which have 200, 250 seats. A standalone has only 60. So to maintain a restaurant this size obviously needs much more, um, yeah, cost more money. And you probably wouldn't do this outside if you do it on your own. Um, but I would never really hesitate to say I wouldn't try it myself to do it because I think there's a lot of advantages. But again, I think value for money is the most important. I, uh, you know, I 100% uh, agree with uh, what my fellow colleagues have said. Uh, a part of that, there is a particular format which is called uh, menu engineering. Um, I think it comes very handy. Uh, menu engineering is uh, nothing else but a study of uh, profitability vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, how much of uh, sales of a particular commodity is happening. So I think uh, uh, that comes in very, very handy. It is very important for us chefs to understand the differential between uh, uh, what is your potential cost, which goes as per your standard recipe, and what is your actual cost? The difference there, of course, obviously will be a difference between both the costs. But uh, uh, it is important to understand and answer it to ourselves that uh, where are we going wrong and why the differential is increasing, increasing in case it's increasing. That uh, study is important for all of us, I think. Great. Thank you. Those were great inputs from uh, all the esteemed panelists here. Now I'll open the stage for uh, questions. Anybody uh, wants to ask something specific? Okay, I think <laughs> coffee is needed. Since there's no question. I think just to add on when it comes to menu engineering, I think you need to understand your customer, right? When you open a standalone, you make your market study to understand what kind of restaurant are you going to open. And I think it's the same with the menu. If I know that my customer which passes by is not really up for a lobster and the prawns, there's no point for me to put it on the menu. So I think that's the, besides the menu engineering, I think it's very important to understand who is actually your customer, your target audience, because you know, when you do marketing, it's the same thing. Who do you market? Yeah. You can't just, because I think one thing we have to understand, and in the old days, and again, I always go back to myself because I was a typical example. You try to please everyone. In the end, you realize you don't please anyone. But you know, today, if you look at the restaurants, the cool, so-called cool new restaurants, they are serving everything for everyone and they're costing them very little, like compared to, you know, earlier it used to be a fine dining experience. You go to a restaurant, you know you're going to, you know, be empty uh, with your pocket for that amount. But today, you can get that same fine dining experiences at other restaurants which are as cool. They're offering everything, they, you know, all, whether you call it fusion or you call it modern food, and they're, and they're pricing very little. But they're full, they're packed. It's a biased market today. It it's is, a huge market. It is a biased market. Yeah, but I think if you go to conceptual restaurants, really have a concept and a story behind, they do not serve everything. They have very partic yes. particular things. This is what we serve. You don't like it. You know what? Next door, there's another restaurant. Yeah. So it's not that they are arrogant and saying we don't want these customers. But again, and again, when you look at hotels, you have an Oberoi, you have a Taj, and you have an Andas, which is totally different. An Oberoi guest might not be the, yeah. our customer than Andas because it's just not his now, do I try to please him? No, because I can't, because I'm not an Oberoi. So I think that's the same in restaurants. Right. Uh, yeah, somebody wants to finally ask somebody. Can we have a mic for the lady, please? Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to know what is the opportunity that chefs in the hotels actually see for 
moving out of the hotels. I mean, you know, Taba by Claridge's has done it. But the idea is that, is there a possibility that in the future, a lot of fine dining restaurants which are there in the hotels are likely to move out and become standalone restaurants and brands by themselves? Do you mean restaurants or chefs? Restaurants. Restaurant concepts. Yes. Well, I, th I think eventually now, again, these days, I mean, we had it in our company was an experiment, to, to be very honest, to, because we try to run the food hall as a standalone. Marketing is completely separate. Now, obviously, behind back doors, we're still employed in the hotel. Uh, I do believe that there's possibilities. Same way around where you see that actually standalones coming into hotels. So I think the same concept will definitely work. And do you see in India that becoming a norm, wherein a lot of standalone restaurants would actually come within the hotels and hotels may not want to do their own restaurant brands? I think it's all in the interest of the owners, right? I mean, if the owner has a very good offer, he can't refuse to have some restaurant in his hotel where he gets his rent, his, you know, and he doesn't have to deal with it. I certainly believe that there is certain concept. And I know I think Indian accent, for an example, is now the best example, is moving into the Lodi Hotel. So I think there you have your best example already. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, the restaurants, the restaurant industry is growing at a very fast pace. Today you have uh, the restaurant industry is, get, is, uh, is getting a revenue of approximately 22,000 CR per year. It's huge. It's massive. You do not do that kind of business in hotels. And it is, it is also about creating a brand. I think if I understand the question correctly is that if restaurant Hotel restaurants can move out as an independent restaurant, what you said, right? And vice versa, too. I mean, so, I mean, I think Dhabaiwa Claridge is, is an example. It was earlier a hotel restaurant, but then they made a brand for themselves and they moved out as an independent restaurant. So, it is also about that the entity which is wanting to venture out into independent market, what is the positioning, what's the brand recognition, what's the brand recall value for a customer. Now, I may have the best restaurant, but it doesn't have the brand recall, there's no point that I open a restaurant because, like I said, as much as I like to serve my customers and make them happy and give them an immersive interactive experience, if, it doesn't, if I don't have the market to Alex's point and if I don't make the money, it's, it's not worthwhile. It's not worthwhile for the investors, for the operators and or for the consumer. So it is all about what that brand has recall value, what is or is the market ready for that and the other way around as well. I mean, Hyatt Churchill has... Uh, has a restaurant which is run by an Italian chef. It's in the hotel, but it's run right. by an independent chef. So it all depends on what the market wants. And, but yeah, it, it may happen, it may not happen. I think just our, to add on, I think our disadvantage in five-star hotels is the moment people hear five-star hotel, they say it's too expensive, I'm not going there. Yeah. And I think that's the perception which we have to change, where we have to make people aware that just being in a five-star hotel doesn't mean I'm pricing my restaurant as a five-star mm -hmm. pricing. Because again, for me, value for money is very important. Now, we do have to have some certain dishes which are more expensive because you do have business dinners where people do not want to have a dal magni. But in the end of the day, the pricing, I think, is very important. We, as, in, uh, as an example, again, in our, in our company, to try to showcase that we can run hotel restaurants on a free standalone level uh, is proven right now because we do pretty well for what we do. I think we have that in the UK. That's a lot of restaurants in, are in, you know, opened in, in, in hotels. Like, I don't know if you know Atul Kocher. He's quite a, quite a celebrated chef. He's opened Sindhu Malu in a hotel as well. So there are lots and lots of chefs who are opening, um, as Alex and Vivek said, it depends on how much, you know, uh, rates of how, you know, how will they get it and, and also marking the prices not as a five-star hotel. So there is a trend in the UK, so I think hopefully it will come in, U in, in India as well. And I suppose an independent restaurant coming to a hotel, there are more chances of that rather than a restaurant going out because, you know, suddenly if a Wasabi, for example, opens out of Taj and, you know, opens as an independent entity, they would, they probably cannot charge as much. And, you know, it would be, so if, if I'm a customer, why would I ever go back to the hotel if I have a cheap alternative of the same and then I think it also kind of confuses your your you know your customers so but the other way around definitely is I suppose possible and in the independent restaurant starts doing well and then they get absorbed by a hotel into the hotel experience so all and right as, any more sorry sorry it is as well to do with uh, your target audience your target audience completely switches over right absolutely correct uh, any more questions? Yes, please. There's a gentleman there. Uh, could we have the mic uh, handed over to him, please? 
Yeah, I have a mic. I'll just ask you. So after, oh, yeah, sorry. I, sorry. I, no, please go ahead. You can go ahead since you have the mic and then we will ask him. Yeah, so I, my, my question is uh, the Chinese cuisine, what are the new trends and it's very close to the Indian food. People think that it's Indo-Chinese food is a new trend which is coming in. So what do you think that, uh, what is, do we have a future for Chinese food in India and uh, apart from the cart food, what we have? The Chinese food as we know it um, is not really Chinese food. I mean, I've worked in China twice on two different occasions. And the real Chinese food is so much more different from what we perceive it to be. I think there is market for every cuisine which is done authentically. I mean, Hyatt is a great example. When they opened China Kitchen, they had six Chinese chefs who were making authentic Chinese food. I mean, we have a Chinese chef who's from Beijing. He makes authentic Chinese food. So it is about, and I'll, I'll go back to, I was in Spain a long time ago. I opened up an Indian restaurant. And our 80% of our clientele were uh, Britishers. And they wanted the balti chicken and the onion bhaji. And they said, that's the food we like. That's the food we want. And I said, listen, I don't know what this food is. I'm an Indian chef. I can cook authentic Indian food. So for six months, we had a huge standoff between the management, my, my, my boss, the GM, and, and me. And I said, I can't cook that food. I don't know that food. If you've got me, let me make authentic Indian food. And they said, the restaurant won't run. I said, let me educate my clients. So six months, it took me for, for them to get convinced that, you know what, this is the Indian food that we should make. And Thankfully, to vindicate what I had taken a stand for, the restaurant did exceptionally well. It was the highest money-making restaurant in a complex of 23 restaurants in that hotel. So it is about, so, the, so authentic food done well, and if you educate our clients, we'll always do well. So there's always that scope. There's always that, that scope that a proper Sichuan restaurant or a, or a Shanghainese food restaurant or a Sudanese food or a Guangdong food restaurant will do exceptionally well as long as that restaurant, independent restaurant, has the bandwidth to, or the patience to educate the clients. Because in our minds, the person of Chinese food may be totally different than what it actually is. So, and I mean, it's, it's a very broad term. Now, China has a variety of cuisines and they can only make a particular style. I mean, if it's a, it's a, it's a Guangdong or a, or a Cantonese chef, he can only make Cantonese food. He can't make Shanghai food, which is different from what Cantonese food is all about. So the market is always there to your question, but does the restaurant owner has the patience to educate the clients or is again the question comes to is the market ready for that cuisine yeah so my question is only on the indian chinese food that that's not the chinese chinese food because nobody understand peking duck in india we are a and population of 1.3 billion people and i'm sure there will always be market for that chinese indian food I mean, yes. it's it's served everywhere okay yeah. okay thanks yeah just i think the, as you said the Chinese cuisine, we need to define what's Chinese cuisine actually, right? I think a lot of people are not really aware of it. We're opening a Cantonese restaurant uh, end of this year, um, so which will be very interesting to see because I know that the Indian palate is more on the spicy side. Cantonese food is not spicy at all. So that's where we really have to see how much actually Indianized we're going to do the menu, which is not in my favor because I think we have to keep it authentic. But uh, yeah, we'll see. If that's a new trend, I'm not too sure about that. Keep the chilies on the side, it'll yeah, be exactly. fine. Exactly, keep yeah. the fresh chili. <laughs> we'll move on. I think we'll take the last question there. The gentleman there, can we have the mic uh, passed on? Hi, my name is Jaydeep and I write, write a lot on food and uh, the technology. So the question to uh, chefs, uh, there are a lot of uh, secrets each chef carries, like the innovations, experimentations. So, uh, what do you prefer? You prefer to keep your secrets hidden uh, just within you or you keep on sharing to excel more in life? So, what are the trends like? Well, or I'm sharing it all the time. Let's ask the <laughs> chefs of the restaurants here. If I tell you, I'll have to kill you. <laughs> no, um, no, no. I, I don't think, uh, and I'll tell you why. As much as of a science cooking is, it is also an art. Now, each one of us so if we take one recipe, each one of us in this room, each one of us will interpret differently. And that is the basic rule of cooking. So as much as science is involved and as much as art, there's also a lot of instinct which goes in cooking food. How you feel about cooking the dish and, and what's your feel for the ingredient or, or whatever dish you're making. So I don't think keeping secrets will help in any, which, any form because, I mean, that, that's my take really, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, no, no secrets at all. I don't think there are secrets warranted in, in, in 
it's not a state secret. Um, I think nowadays, as I said earlier before as well, social media can go online and have 20 different recipes of garam masala or something like that. And we all kind of make, and for me, I think I'm, le I'm still learning. I learned from a lot, from a lot of people. Um, I, I would never pick my hand up. I say, I know everything. I'm s every single day I learn. And for me, I, I, you know, people when ask me, punch four and I think that is the best killer combination you can have as a grow Punjabi um, girl growing up in Bengal that can uh, work a magic with Punjabi food and Bengali food. Punch four and for me is my secret, I would say. Well, I, 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 don't, I do not see any reason to hide secrets because there's, you know, we said we had, uh, in the past we had a concept which some rich and famous investor came, not in India, in Turkey actually. He came, he looked at the concept, he copy paste the same thing. He was not able to run it because he didn't understand it. So you think, if I give you a recipe, it doesn't mean that you're able to copy the recipe exactly the way I would like to imagine it. So, I mean, in the end of the day, there's no negativity. And again, these days, I think it's important that we chefs share recipe because we learn again from each other, challenge each other, come up with something new. And I think that's how a trend actually gets created. And I think if you look at Spain as an example, right, all of these chefs, I mean, if you're in the top 10, there is, I think, three Spanish restaurants, Spanish chefs. They have started because Massimo Bottura did something, then the Rocca brothers come, they did something, and they all try to push up the whole trend in general. So I think it's important that we share these recipes. I think, uh, Jairi, your question is basically coming from Indian cuisine primarily. Indian cuisine uh, over the ages has never been written. I 100% agree. And there's no standardization in uh, any of the Indian products. You go into something which is as basic as dal makhni. You know, you will probably get 500 different recipes uh, of dal makhni which is floating around. Every restaurant, every outlet has a different recipe that they follow. But uh, uh, whereas you compare it with uh, your uh, Western cuisines, bechamel has a standard recipe, tomato sauce has a standard recipe. Uh, you know, everything has been written down, has been penned down. Uh, for certain reasons, uh, in Indian cuisine, it has not been done, but it is high time that we should... Uh, we should do it. Uh, I don't think that any of us uh, uh, in the uh, educated uh, stream, educated chefs, would try to keep a secret in our recipes. We want them to go out. We want people to talk about it. Today, all of us, all chefs are writing their recipes and publishing it. You know, we want it to be, we, all, we want to be very, very open about it. Yeah. I think that's why the profession of chef is called a combination of passion and creativity. You know, you put three chefs together, give them the same recipe, trust me, they will create three different, uh, you know, uh, final dishes out of it. So, and that's why I think, you know, you say, na, ki, uh, ma ke jaisa bana lo khana, lekin ma jaisa kabhi nahi ban sakta. You know, she'll give you the recipe and a mother will definitely not hide the recipe. And trust me, I've done it, but I still cannot get the same taste. So, I suppose, haath, haath ka jadu bhi kuch hota, you know, it's, it's also in your hands. So, and, and chef, uh, community, I, I've become a chef for the last five years, I used to be acting. And trust me, since the time I got, you know, initiated into this, apart from the fact that I learned from books and uh, went and did an advanced culinary course, what I learned, where I learned the maximum was from my chefs. Every time I would sit with them and I would pick their brains and everybody would be so generous with the amount of information they would give me and even recipes. And that made me realize that I love this profession even more because actors will always be competitive. They will not, you know, they'll always have that insecurity. I think chefs are basically very secure people and I think that's the most fantastic thing and I think they deserve a big round of applause just for that <laughs> which will probably wake you up and uh, I think are we done with it any more questions or okay uh, two, uh, do we have time for two questions we'll take one last question so sorry Hi, uh, I'm Hemant Walia it's a very uh, interesting session uh, thank you for opening up and uh, giving insights I'm an investor and I actually collect money from restaurants. I, <laughs> I've invested in commercial properties. So, but I was, uh, I, I, I feel sorry sometimes people put in a lot of hard work but their restaurants don't work for some reason or the other. What do you suggest, what are the concerns to make sure the restaurants have longevity, longevity and profits, profitability? It's, uh, I think uh, it is very important for chefs for entrepreneurs to understand the basic thing which is target audience. If you understand your target audience, 
and you develop the concept, you weave the concept around your target audience, that's the right approach to, to initiate any, any business. And, and trust me, at the age of 40, opening my restaurant as a female and not giving up, um, you have a dream, you follow that dream. And also, um, you know, Gotham really said that you need to understand your target audience. And I, 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 where I live in a small town, I, I always, people travel from all over the world to come and eat there because I know what they want. You know, if they want lobster, I'll put lobster. If they want crab, they'll put that. I know, but then at the same time, I'm not scared of working really hard. If I have to, I'll still wear my heels and work 16 hours. I like to look good and cook. Yeah, we talked about this also earlier. I think for an investor, is important. if you hire a chef, let the chef do his job. That's why you hired him. Because I have seen examples that investor hired a chef and, you know, the investor traveled around the world, came back and said, oh, you know what, chef, I saw this recipe in wherever. Let's put this on the menu. Now, that recipe didn't fit at all in the concept, but the investor insisted of having this recipe on the menu. Now, first of all, the chef is demotivated because he doesn't like to cook that recipe because it's not his recipe. So that's already where the disconnect starts. And I say the moment the disconnect between investors and the chefs, or for us general managers and chefs, the same thing, uh, the disconnect is not there anymore. That's where I think it starts to become difficult. So I think you have to find the right person. And again, target audience is very, very important. Location and deep pockets. Sometimes the restaurant may not take off as soon as you hope to, or as well as you hope it to. Now, if you don't have deep enough pockets, you may get jittery and it's, it's a vicious cycle. And I'll, you don't make the money, you start cutting costs. You start cutting costs, the experience suffers. The experience suffers, the few people who are coming will say, you know what, this place is no good. They don't serve good food. It's not served fast enough. And the perception starts to change. So with everything else and everything makes complete sense, you've got to have deep enough pockets to be able to sustain without changing your vision of services, your vision of quality of food, your vision of concept, until such time that you find that winning formula. It should be a winning formula from the very beginning because you've done the groundwork, but then deep pockets also play a very important role. You can't start cutting just because you're not making enough money in the beginning. Yeah. Keep it interesting and have a story. Tell the story, why do you do what you do? And believe in your chef. And believe in your chef. That, that is really important. I've seen a lot of restaurants disintegrate because, you know, the manager and the chef are always fighting. But anyway, I think uh, with that, we can uh, wrap up the session. All right. With your permission. All right. So first, can we have a huge round of applause to thank all of our speakers as well? Very, very interesting and uh, very invigorating perspectives there from all of you. So thank you so much. I'm going to request our session moderator, Chef Amrita Raichan, to please present the mementos to fellow panel members as well. Firstly, to Chef Romy Gill. to Chef Alexander Moser. To Chef Gautam Chaudhary. to Chef Vivek Bhatt. 